understand the world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is David. It's the week that's in it. I don't have to explain it to anybody. We're trying to make things a little bit more comprehensible, but as every day goes by, every hour goes by, things are becoming less and less normal, more and more abnormal. And yet, this thing will pass. I'm not too sure when, but it will pass. And sometimes you've got to keep that in the back of your head when you're stressed and when you're anxious and when you don't know what's coming next. I'm here with your man. How are you, Head? At a safe distance? <laughs> At a safe distance, yeah. This um, social distancing is uh, its tricky, isn't it? It is tricky. It is actually, when you start trying to uh, apply it, you, you suddenly realise how kind of tactile we are and how kind of close. And how uh, social we are. And how social, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's having an, a weird effect on families and on relationships. Big time, yeah. I mean, our home here has turned into the Big Brother house. <laughs> and I would like to vote off the other people in the place if I can. Yeah, I think you're going to be voted out, Max, first. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's true, isn't it? It's 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 putting a strain on 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 families, and putting a strain on. It's just that idea that we're all living that one iteration closer. Yeah, that we haven't done before. And it, and it's kind of it. There's this underlying anxiety and uncertainty. Yeah. And that is the most unsettling feeling. Do you know what's interesting? My One of my nieces in London, Neve, she works kind of on the front line with a lot of kind of housing and social and all that kind of stuff. And she was saying that there's a huge spike in domestic violence. Yeah, I'm sure. Wh- I'm which makes sure. sense, but it's awful to think. No, but it's, I mean, again, these are the, the unseen ramifications yeah. of what we're going through and could go through for quite some time. And I mean, it's even at a more moderate idea than domestic violence, obviously, is the fact that the way this is panning out, you can see certain people are good at dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. And certain people are really bad at dealing with uncertainty. And that is always masked when things are normal. But now when you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, Mm. You know, I see around me people who just are hardwired not to deal with uncertainty and they're actually find it very difficult. And that's going to get worse. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's just one thing I would say is that in the, and this is overlooked a lot, but in the kind of autistic world, people who are on the spectrum, you know, what, there's loads of different types of autism and Asperger's, etc., But there is one common theme, which is when things go a little bit askew, when there is uncertainty, autistic people tend to freak out. Your 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 daughter Emma, yeah, is 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 absolutely and how how she and how's she getting on? She's getting on. She's handling it really well, actually. She's keeping herself really busy, and it's about she's got to keep herself busy. But you know who's brilliant is as I am. It's Adam Harris, actually Simon Harris's younger brother who is autistic, but he set up this organization called As I Am, and they advocate for the autistic community. They have loads of really and good... And is Emma available about all yeah, that stuff? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, I, and I would recommend anybody to get onto asiam.ie. Brilliant resources for, for it, not just for the autistic community, but for everybody. And tell me, and apart from Emma, are you killing each other up there in Slorgan? We're all right. The We're all right. <laughs> <laughs> I go out to the man shed. Now it's the real value of the man shed is, is coming to the fore. By now. the way, uh, you should see John's man shed. It is <laughs> brilliant. located, I'd say, circa 1988, summer of 88, 89. That's the style, all right? That's the style. It's very mullety. If you have a mullet, you'll feel very at home there. Uh you know what he does there. He turns on the tunes, puts the headphones in, and he's off for the day. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about economics. <laughs> so, Mac, let's get into what's going on and what it means economically. And for, you know, for day-to-day business, there's loads of people being laid off. You, you gave me a figure the other day. Yeah, I mean, it looks as if we haven't got the figures absolutely accurately, 
Yeah. But it looks as if about 200,000 people in Ireland have been laid off this week. Now, that is phenomenal. So, what is that? That's 10%. That's about 10% of the working population. Yeah. It looks as if Ireland is laying off people quicker than anywhere else. Now, that is a big problem. Uh, and that's to do with the fact that about half of all Irish people work in companies what are called micro companies, mm. which have less than 50 employees, right? So these are sort of companies that are small, they're doing their own thing, they're kind of starty uppy, or they're in the service sector or whatever, right? We have a higher proportion of that kind of business. Much in, higher than, right. than, so basically in Ireland, just if we, if we look at it, right? Take the total labor force. 15% of people work in the public sector. Yeah. They are affected by this, but they will be unaffected in terms of their wages. Yeah. 15% of people also work in the multinational sector. Yeah. A huge portion of those companies are incredibly well capitalized. They are incredibly, they will be able to deal with this. That means that leaves 70% of all workers in Ireland work in the private sector. So we're all exposed. And of those half, not half of the 70, but half of the total, mm work in these micro companies. Yeah. Micro companies don't have the cash flow, the resources, and the visibility to go and say, well, you know what? I can actually deal with four or five months of not selling. And I can see, let's say to 2021. Yeah. So as a result of that weird structure, Ireland is, you know, flexible on the way up, which is when when we're doing well, you get huge increases in employment, very, very quick increases of employment the barriers to employing people, i.e. the difficulty of taking people on, almost zero here. But on the downside, what you get is very high levels of uncertainty, uh, very high levels of fragility. And what we're seeing now is very, very significant levels of layoffs, immediate layoffs. Mm. And I think that all economic policy now, John, everything should be driven to preserve jobs, to maintain jobs, and to try and see this crisis as temporary. And as a result of that, to do everything we possibly can to preserve employment. And the reason is following unemployment is not economic. It's emotional. It's psychological. It destroys the person in many cases it just destroys those around I mean, you know yeah. my dad lost his job when yeah we were yeah kids. i remember that yeah you know and that was a long time ago you know late 70s it changed him profoundly mm. it and may you. it maybe changed me as yeah, well it, did. it maybe changed me as well because you know you see what happens to you know a proud man a typical you know typical dub typical proud man who is told you know you're surplus to our requirements. You are laid off. You mm. are redundant. Like Think about even the word redundant. And I, it really affected me. And I only understood this as I got older. Yeah, yeah. And the way I see the world, in actual fact, the way I see economics has always been informed by the fact that we've got to try and keep levels of employment as high as possible, which is why I sometimes get a bit more, not emotional, but a bit more aggressive in recommendations in the face of people to say, oh, well, you know, the company will close down, it'll just open up again. And yeah. That's not what happens. It's so, about the human. It's about, it's about the, the human, you know? And I, I think, you know, maybe this, 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 this week's podcast should be called Economics with a Human Face. What can we do right now, faced with the coronavirus, to minimize the amount of people who have to go home, open the front door, and say to whoever's at home, or wait for their partner and say, I've been laid off. Because that person who has been laid off is a totally different individual to the same person who has been kept on at a lower wage. Mm. Because unemployment really, really diminishes people. Yeah. And dependency diminishes people. When you're dependent on a handout or welfare or whatever, it changes your sense of yourself. So I think that we've got to do, and I think we can do, everything possible to maintain levels of employment right now. Because the good news is, John, it's doable. Yeah. The even better news is it's doable without a huge cost. And the third idea is that it's doable 
if we become a little bit more courageous with our way of thinking about the economy. Yeah. But okay, let's go. I'm going to ask you about that in a second. But the big problem at the moment is we don't know. It's it's a timing problem. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. If we knew this is two months, great, done and dust. We'll swallow it for two months. We'll get on with it. And in two months, it'll all be fine. We simply don't know that. We don't know. But not knowing should not be the weapon that keeps you paralyzed. Mm. You know, uncertainty is a fact of life. And not knowing how this pans out should not be the one issue that prevents us from helping people. Martin Luther King had a great expression. He called it the fierce urgency of now. Yeah. That tomorrow isn't important. The next day isn't important. Now is important. And all economic policy, in the same way as all health policy now, is being driven to try and minimize the future impact on ICU, i.e. so our behavior today changes what happens in the future. All economic policy should be driven at today. Not how much it's going to cost tomorrow and how much it's going to cost in the future, but actually what can we do today to minimize this enormous anxiety that people are feeling. Mm. And I look at it, you know, a wee bit like hibernation. Like the economy's gone into hibernation. Yeah. Now imagine that, right? Do you remember when you were in school, you learned, right? And the little, the bear took up all the nuts and got, their, got all their supply together and then went to sleep, right? And that's what we're doing now. And that demands a suspension of capitalism. This is a big, big idea that capitalism has now been suspended all around the world. And the state needs to understand that it has to come in with all its firepower and it can be done. Not worry about the cost because the cost tomorrow will be much less than the cost today if we do nothing. Okay, so we're taking a particular approach here in Ireland. Number one, are we taking the right approach? And, you know, is there something we can learn from elsewhere? Well, it's interesting, John. I would love the same urgency that has been deployed by and displayed by the health service Mm. to be displayed by the Department of Finance and the Central Bank. So basically you have the health service, which looks after the health of the nation, and you have the Department of Finance and the Central Bank, which actually looks after the economy of the nation. Yeah. I think both of those have been a little bit slow. I'm not going to criticize people because we're all in the same boat, but I'm saying there's more we can do. So for example, last week we spoke about this idea of helicopter money. Yeah. And I want to come back to it because this is part of the solution. This week, the European Central Bank unveiled its massive, they call bazooka, which was <laughs> Seth, I know. Everyone veiled your bazooka, man. Anyway, I hear. Yeah, I hear. <laughs> I know. It's funny, I'm getting all smutty as well. We're all, we're all locked up but in see, the house. Actually, a little aside, you know, we talk about domestic violence. The flip side of that is, in around Christmas, there's going to be a huge baby boom. There's going to be a massive baby boom, a massive, massive baby boom. Listen, I've got, I've got, I've got to come up with a cliche already. I'll have the book written before Christmas. But, Go on, sorry. Let's go back, right? So the ECB, I mean, last week I was saying that I believe you won Lagarde. Christine Lagarde is the greatest fraud in public life. Yeah, yeah. That has now been confirmed by the fact that last week she was saying, oh, it's not our job to bail out Italy. This week she's saying, here's 750 billion, which is 7% of European GDP to bail out everybody. So this is a woman who has no idea. Right? Yeah. She's a she's a marionette. She's just a puppet, right? Right. No, she is. You know, yeah. so last week she was like, everything's cool. This week, and it wasn't as if she was everything's cool. Last week she was definitive in her role, which was we will not help the Italians. Yeah. Which is outrageous given what we know is happening in Italy. We yeah. should give them all the help. Not only because we should give them all the help, but it's coming our way anyway. Has she ever worked in the real world, apart no, from that kind Baker, of big Baker, high... Baker McKinsey law firm yeah. doing contracts, you know. Okay, okay. Well, that explains know, probably a lot. Yeah, no, I've I've always thought, even though I'm married to one, well, Shan's a recovering lawyer. It's, <laughs> a, it's like being an alcoholic. It's a 12-stage step, isn't it? You know, she's got to buddy up with other recovering <laughs> lawyers. But I've always thought that, that they're a fraud, fraudulent effort. Anyway, lawyers should never be put in charge of economics because they believe in the permanency of contracts, Mm. which means that the world always stays the same. Think about the logic of that. Economics is all about dealing with uncertainty, that the world always changes. And people. And people and human nature. 
and the weirdness of human nature. So if you put a lawyer at the top of an economic organization, they are going to believe in a static world. Mm. You can't have someone like that at the top of an economic organization. You have to have somebody who believes in a fluid, flexible world. That's why somebody like that is kind of a fraud because they must know in themselves that they don't understand what they're talking about, but yet they put themselves forward for the job. Yeah. But anyway, enough of that. That's for another day. Okay, okay. So the ECB said, we are now going to reveal our bazooka. We are going to make available 750 billion euros of what they call QE. Now, most people think, what is this QE, right? Yeah. So what QE is, like, park the word QE, right? What happens is a central bank works what's called monetary policy through the banking system. So the central bank lends money to the banks and the banks lend money to us. Mm. Now, what happens in a situation like this is the banks are paralyzed because number one, they still have a lot of bad debt on their books. Yeah. And number two, they have nobody who wants to borrow. So the central bank says, we will give you all this money and you please lend this out. But if you think about this, if you got the image of, and this is the image I see all the time, of a big hose, and it's like, we're going to hose all this money against the coronavirus, right. against the thing, right? Yeah. But the problem is, imagine it was a garden hose, right? It's not as if the money comes straight gushing out, because I think what we need to do is we need to get the money into people's pockets and businesses' pockets to stop the downturn. Yeah. That's the key. QE doesn't get money into businesses' pockets. It doesn't put money into people's pockets. What it does is say, the money is there if you want to borrow. But nobody wants to borrow now because everyone's traumatized. Of course, yeah, yeah. And with, if Especially you, with all the uncertainty. Yeah, you, and if you want to borrow, it has to go to. through the banks and the bank credit committee and some little geezer who's worried about your default and blah, blah, blah. So what was originally a hose ends up being a trickle into the real yeah. economy. Yeah. So my idea, not just mine, many other economists' idea, is take all that money that the ECB promises and just deposit it directly into people's accounts, which goes quickly, it's real, you avoid the banking system, yeah. and what you do is you assuage people's fear. And I come back to this idea. The biggest fear in the small company, remember the idea we're saying half Irish people are employed in these micro companies, mm. is that you will run out of money that you, let's say you're a cafe, you close yeah, down. Yeah. You have seven employees or 10 employees. You close down, your revenue stops. You have no revenue with which to pay your people. Mm. So you've no choice but to lay those people yeah. off, right? What I'm saying is if we deposited 10 grand, five grand, whatever it happens to be, into the accounts of that cafe, they would think twice about laying people off because they wouldn't have to lay people off. Yeah. Now, the people who supply that cafe with coffee, for example, who supply the coffee and then wait for payment a month later, who are now panicking that they're not going to get paid, yeah. if they know that the cafe has money because the government has injected money into the cafe's accounts, they will say, okay, that's grand. We're still on those two or three month terms of credit. Yeah, that's fine. You guys have money. What happens in a crisis is you don't actually run out of money. You run out of time. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, what I mean by that is, like, so for example, if in normal times I'm your supplier, right? Mm. Take the, the coffee shop idea yeah, again, right? Yeah. I give you coffee beans. You say, that's great. I'm going to pay you in three months' time. You say, that's grand. Okay, everything's fine. You write the contract. The minute you have a credit crunch or a shock to the economy, you then say, mm, I'd like that money now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So all time horizons contract. So a contract that was three months gotcha. suddenly okay. becomes one day. To use the expression, tomorrow becomes today. That's the nature of a right. credit crunch. So the job of the central bank is to inject free money now so that people are assuaged, so that the contracts that were there for three months remain three months. So that's why I think we should do this helicopter money. It's not that I think everybody should go out and spend, but the point is during the hibernation period, you stop the panic which forces companies to go bankrupt. That's the first, I think, thing we can do. Sorry, can I just ask you, you know, when you said about you're not trying to get people to go out and spend, but 
also that coffee shop still needs some sort of turnover. Yeah, it does. There, there's, as you say, there's a time limit. So the this over, can't go on for like forever. Well, the, for the interesting thing about a helicopter money is it can. As long as you have deflation, it can go on for a long, right. long time. But the second thing we should do is what the Danes introduced last Sunday night. Yeah. And what the Brits actually introduced last Friday night. The most critical link in the chain going back to, you know, my dad being laid off or yeah. whatever, right, is to dissuade the company from laying off the people, right? Because you've got to get in there before the company lays people off, not after. At the moment, we're doing this, and if you lose your job, we will give you X amount of money. But that's too late. You've already lost the person, right? The person is already going home anxious. Yeah. The person is already feeling awful, and if the lockdown is three or four months, that person is going to find it psychologically and emotionally very difficult. So you intervene before that. And that is, you say to the employer, if you have a fear that you're running out of money, don't worry, we will pay the wages of the person you're about to lay off. So suddenly we hold everything in a state of status. Mm. Now, Look at the, the numbers here, right? If you look at what the Danes introduced and what the British have introduced, which is we're going to pay 75% of the wages of people who've been laid off for the next three months. If you think about it in Ireland, right, the average wage is 40 grand a year yeah. in this country. Apparently, up to 400,000 people will be laid off in the next couple of weeks. Right? Yeah. So you multiply 400,000 by 40 to give you the total quantum. That's mm. 16 billion, which would cost for a year for the state to pay the wages of these people. Okay. Right? But it's not going to be 16 billion. It's going to be one quarter of that because it's only for three months. Right? Okay. So suddenly it's 4 billion. Right? And what this, the Danish state has said to its employers is we will pay 75% of the wages. So suddenly the cost of the state is 75% of 4 billion. It's 3 billion. We have an economy whose GDP is 300 billion. So it's 1% of GDP to assuage all okay. these fears. Okay. It's so small. Yeah. And right now the ECB has given the state the opportunity to borrow money at minus 0 0.75. So the ECB is saying, we will pay you to borrow. So the state could so easily borrow this. And one fell swoop, what it's saying to the people is, we will look after you. Don't worry. Do not lay people off because we're going to pay 75% of their wages. It's going to cost 1% of GDP over the next three months in order to inject a little bit of calm, as I said, socially, emotionally, self-worth, no humiliation. And then we go into hibernation, the whole country, without fear or without excessive fear. And that seems to me, that has to be the economic objective of the next three or four months. Okay, so that kind of sorts out the employee and the unemployment issue. And then, by the way, we've got the self-employed people like you and me. Well, absolutely. I was going to say that. But you know. that's why we need the helicopter money. Yeah. Because people like us don't have an employer, you know? And yeah. there are many, many tens of thousands of self-employed people yeah. here. I've lost a lot of work already. And we, we need also to be represented in this yeah. large, I wouldn't call it a bailout. It's more like a parachute. Yeah. You know, we've been kind of, we've been fucked out of the plane. And here's the parachute, which will make sure that the landing is softer. Right. And again, money is not the object. I would really want to reiterate to people, I can't reiterate enough, that right now, money is free. And that's the key. So when you talk about suspending capitalism, yeah. putting it on pause, so what takes its place and how does this affect corporations? 
Well, from a, from a corporate, we've yeah. talked about the human thing, but how does it affect corporations? Well, all corporations are going to be profoundly negatively affected by this. All of them, because everything depends on demand. Yeah. And demand has stopped. Of course. No matter what you're doing, unless you're in farming, for example, where demand will continue, unless you're in pharmaceuticals where demand will continue, but in most sectors, demand has totally stopped. But there now comes a contrast between what went before when corporations were bailed out and what has to be now where the average Joe is bailed out. Mm. I think we're looking at a profound change in the way the world works. And it ain't going to go back to the way it was before. It's not going to go back to chief executives earning 100, 200, 300 times the wages of employees. Right now, if a corporation comes to the state and that corporation is bust, like let's say an airline, mm. I think what the state should say, well, okay, no dividends to shareholders, full stop, right? It's not a shareholder capital system anymore. Yeah. It's a state capital system, yeah. right? You're gone. Chief executives, you can't pay yourself bonuses. No, stop, right? We're looking after your employees. We're actually looking, we're paying the yeah. bill for your employees, yeah. right? You have got to back off and be much more socially observant, much more in, understand that the company is not just an entity which maximizes uh, how, profit. How are they going to kind of re enforce that? It's very simple. You say you want a bailout. Here's the term. Terms and conditions apply. It's interesting because there's all sorts of stories. I don't know what's true and what's not true or what's exaggeration or not. But the one story I did hear was EasyJet are looking for a bailout while they're paying their, their shareholders huge dividends. They should be told to fuck off. Well, yeah. Simply, you know, look. I mean, is it a time for, you know, we bailed out, we personally bailed out the banks we, here. I'm, I'm, and uh, is, it, is it time and is it reasonable for us to say, banks, it's time to, for you to bail us out? Absolutely. But the problem is you can never depend on banks. This is what I come back to. Remember this idea that if you want... QE to operate via the banking system, nothing will be done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In actual fact, I think the banking system is over. I think in 10 years' time, the banks that we think, that notion of banks, I think it's all gone. Right? But that's a different, that's a different yeah. argument. Is that, is that, is that uh, Bitcoin coming into no, its own it's, then? No, it's just that people will realize if central banks inject money into people's accounts, which they will, in the end, yeah, people will realize, man, we don't need this middleman. We don't need, you know, these guys driving around in BMWs, yeah. in the credit committee of some bank. We don't need them, right? But that's for another day. That's okay, for another okay, day. Yeah, yeah. So let's come back to the idea of a parachute for the people, not for the institutions. In fact, I wouldn't go down the road as saying the institutions of the people are two different entities right now. At the moment, we're all in the same boat. Mm. But I think the behavior of corporates will change and has to change, particularly in the airline industry, which is obviously the most dramatically affected. If you were buying a share in an airline company, you took a risk. That risk has been well, hit yeah. by the coronavirus. It is not up to the state to underwrite your risk. You are a capitalist. Deal with it, man. Right? Shares may go up and down. And That's blah, 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 what the, the man said. <laughs> so let's come back. So I think that what we're looking at is a profound shift in the way in which we think about the world. And this is not something that will, even if we're only in social isolation for two months or three months, I think we're looking at something like the Bretton Woods system after the Second World War, yeah, where countries come together and say, hold on a second, we can't go back to what we were beforehand. Let's change. Now, the interesting thing is my old mate, Yanis yeah. Arafakis, yeah, yeah. has got some interesting views because, again, sometimes in Dublin, we're a little bit isolated. So I think it would be fascinating to hear what he thinks from Greece. So will we go and chat to him? Absolutely. It seems the line is not great, but it's the best we can do at the moment. So uh, let's hear from Yanis. 
Yanis, how are you? I'm very well, and I'm sending my love and affection to um, a country that's very close to my heart. Uh, I think of Ireland as the Greece of the North Atlantic. But you probably don't like to hear that, but that's how I feel about you folks. Well, listen, uh, we could we could we could do with a bit of Greek civilization, a bit of Greek culture, a bit of Greek food, and clearly a bit of Greek weather. But uh, listen, Yanis, where do you think this is going over the next couple of weeks? Well, judging by what has been happening over the previous two weeks, uh, we had a a sequence, of, a comedy of errors by the European authorities. You recall that uh, the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, uh, put a foot in her mouth twice in one and a half minutes, and then she had to um, announce a 750 billion euro worth program in order to uh, make amends for the fact that Italy was almost knocked out of the eurozone as a result of that gaffe. Uh, if you look at the Eurogroup that um, uh, met through a teleconference and uh, decided that the coronavirus crisis is so spectacularly crucial and important and, and a, a, a clear and present threat that they would do nothing for a while. They would just monitor the situation. <laughs> uh, Europe is, is not very good at um, spending the precious few days and, and weeks available to us in order to come up with a gigantic, urgent, important... Uh, fiscal stimulus, which is absolutely necessary for Europe. Uh, is it going to happen? Probably, yes, but it will not be done quickly. It will take more than a couple of weeks. Uh, it will, they, they will kick and scream along the way. And in the meantime, just like in the case of the, um, uh, the, 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 the health uh, aspects of this epidemic, uh, when you need a very quick and fast and furious and effective immediate attack against the, the spread of the disease, we needed some, such a large fiscal stimulus right from the beginning. We didn't get it. So we're going to have um, a, a greater collapse in GDP across Europe than we could have gotten away with. But I think eventually the European Central Bank will have to monetize that. Uh, they will have to do some kind of hel helicopter money. The question is, is it going to be too late to waste uh, the prospects of many people's lives? In other words, will they repeat the performance of 2010? And Janice, you just you talked about helicopter money, which is something we've spoken about in the podcast here, and we'll continue to talk about it. But a lot of people in Ireland are talking about 2010 was, and every single bailout up to then, actually, has always been a bailout for corporations. I, I saw Donald Trump talking about uh, bailing out casinos uh, in the last week. But people are yearning for maybe a bailout of the punter, of the average uh, person who needs protection from what is a serious, just a traumatic turn of events. Do you think that we will see this bailout for the people? It's touch and go. Uh, we certainly should have it. Uh, because, let's face it, this is not 2008, 2010. It's much, much worse than that. Because if for the first time in capitalist history, we have a crisis that attacks simultaneously the demand side and the supply side of the economy, the banking sector and the supply lines, the common folk and corporations, Germany and Ireland. This is a symmetric threat, uh, which uh, sounds less than an asymmetric threat, but it's actually worse in this case. So we should certainly have it. Are we going to have it? Who knows? The, the European authorities are notorious for constantly missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And tell me about Italy. Again, DM, your, your, your new movement has, has a branch in Italy. You know Italy very, very well. How, what is the long term? That's what I'm talking about long term, like I'm talking long term is a couple of weeks and a couple of months in, the, in these days. Implication of the collapse of the Italian health system, the fact that the Italian death rate is going up by six, five, six hundred people a day. Where do you think this is going to position Italy? Well, this is probably a very large straw that breaks the camel's back. By the camel, I mean the patience of the average Italian with the European Union. Every time there's been a crisis from the early 1990s with the ERM, and later with the Euro crisis in 2010, now with the coronavirus, a country like Italy is becoming weaker. Uh, its capacity to recover is lessened. Its potential growth rate drops. And Italy is uh, a significant country. It's a founding member of the European Union. 
Uh, it is a country that uh, has had a sterling record at exporting, so it's not um, relying on the kindness of strangers like um, other countries that are in chronic deficit. Um, it, it, its government has had a primary surplus for a while. It should be doing well, and it should have a capacity to, to, to bounce back from whether the crisis was the euro crisis or the coronavirus crisis. But unfortunately, the way in which our monetary union is structured, the, the European Union has behaved so far, has prevented that from being the case. When you have Matteo Salvini waiting in the wings, uh, biding his time, uh, his uh, opinion poll um, ratings uh, are above 55%. If you add to his party various other neo-fascist parties that support him, um, he's waiting to exploit the opportunity of yet another failure by the European Union to be rational and solidaristic towards it. He's waiting to use this opportunity in order to fragment the EU and uh, to build a, a new Mussolini-esque uh, narrative that uh, would be terrible for Italy, would be terrible for Europe. Janos, before I go, I just want to ask you about Greece. Okay, How are things down there on the street? Uh, also, the issue of migration from Turkey. Just address those two issues tangentially before we go, because we don't have a huge amount of time, but I would like to see what's going on on, on the ground in Greece. Well, firstly, what you've been hearing in the last year or so about the remarkable recovery of Greece, that was never true. Uh, there was a profound paradox. On the one hand, you had um, a population that was sinking deeper into insolvency, while at the same time, those who dealt in Greek bonds with, uh, and also Greek shares made the mint. I'm not going to explain that paradox, but that is the situation that we had before the coronavirus hit. Add to that the weaponization by President Erdogan of Turkey of a few, a few tens of thousands of wretched souls who used to live in camps um, as refugees in Turkey. He's using them in order to put pressure on the European Union uh, to, sub to have the European Union support his imperialistic drive in northern Syria against the Kurds there and elsewhere. Uh, so you, on the one hand, we have um, a Turkish government that is uh, um, utilizing and instrumentalizing poor souls against uh, uh, Greece and against the European Union. And then you have the European Union that is also doing exactly the same thing, committing another crime against logic and humanity by... Um, trying to come to terms with Erdogan through uh, deals with Turkey that uh, are effectively allowing the European Union to um, violate uh, international law about refugees. So it's a, it's a failure of the European Union, effectively, what we're, fa what we're facing, both on the economic front and on the migration. Yanis, listen, I'm going to come back to that story when the coronavirus passes or at least uh, this tempest passes or, or at least we what we call smooth out the curve a wee bit but uh, listen take care of yourself down there it's always a joy to talk to you and uh, I'll talk to you soon well have a glass of whiskey on my behalf I'll have one on yours okay cheers Yanis take care man bye so that was Yanis there John you know I've known him for a long time he's an interesting dude he is he's got one of the best voices so I have to say I love his voice yeah, he's good. I wish he did uh, voiceovers I'd use him all the time well you know every every economist needs a second gig you know? well he, he might need it <laughs> he need a side gig <laughs> Yanis as the nasty man in Finding Nemo or whatever it's called Mega Mind. yeah but brilliant interesting what Yanis was saying there one is that the EU tends to be slow to react. Maybe the crisis yeah. will change that. The second one, I think, is really fascinating. It's the Italians. Italy has, in every crisis, borne more of the brunt of the crisis, been slower to come out of the crisis. And now, of course, you have this horrendous corona crisis there. So it's the idea that Italy is the country we need to be most concerned about. And thirdly, what I thought was fascinating, and we're definitely going to come back to it, is that idea of Erdogan in Turkey weaponizing refugees yeah. by pushing refugees out of Turkey into the EU, into Greece. That's a very murky area, very dark yeah. area. I'd like to come back to that with both Yanis and maybe some Turkish people. I'd we love know. to, to I, I, as I was saying to you before, um, the whole Turkey thing has, um, I find it really curious at the moment. And I think they're playing a dangerous game, but there is something we'll come back to. Let's come back to that at the moment. But 
Yanis's big point there is the world is going to change and we're not going to go back to where we were. But come here to me. One of the other things that I was interested in and come back to Ireland is what it's actually doing to like the housing market, for instance. I was reading there that it's the volume of rental stock in Dublin is up 64%. Alone. Well, that's all the Airbnbers, right? Yeah. It's in central Dublin. And again, I come back to the idea that the world has changed profoundly. If you think, so for example, what's happening in Dublin, right? Yeah. Is all these people who depend on Airbnb, took their houses and their apartments off market. They now realize there ain't going to be any tourists in this country for a long, long time. Yeah. They're back on the market. What's interesting is they're now looking for Airbnb style rents. So the rents they're looking for are way over and above the going rent. That's, of course, going to come down. Yeah. But the legacy of this crisis, I think the long-term implication of this is going to be things like, do you remember we spoke a few weeks ago? I mean, it seems like years ago, an eternity ago, but no, <laughs> the idea of the state deciding to requisition land, yeah, to fast-track planning, fast-track planning of its own land, because the state's the biggest landowner yeah. in the country. The opportunity here for Ireland is to use this crisis as the reason for doing things rather than not doing things. So if we can, and I hope we can, prove that the health service is not what it was before this crisis, which is overblown and bloated and full of waiting lists, mm. but actually can do a job, then I think it clears a path for other parts of the economy where the state and the private sector rub up against each other. For example, the housing market to do something really brilliant. Yeah. So the Airbnb thing on Daft shows that the people who were running Airbnbs depend on the community. Because what is happening now, they're back putting their flats on the community market. Take that as an example and think, maybe there is a long-term positive from this, which is that when we get through it, when we minimize, hopefully, the mortality rate, when we see and we respond to the urges from the ICUs, because what's really interesting now is the only thing that is determining economic policy and social policy and political policy right now are the intensive care units. Yeah. So everything is driven to keep making sure that we don't overburden them. If that works, and if we can bring the mortality rate down lower than China, lower than in, well, hopefully lower than Italy. Yeah. Then I think people will stop and take stock and say, hold on, there is a sweet spot between state intervention and the private sector. We went far too much in the private sector's bias for the last 10 years. In the next few months, we're going to be what's almost war communism, which was Lenin imposed, which is basically the state pays everything. Yeah. But when that is lifted, I think the relationship between the state and the private sector will be much more interesting. And those bottlenecks in our economy around the housing market, where the state and the private sector couldn't act together, I think could be solved and people will say you know what if you have planning permission build on it if we need to build up let's do it if the state needs to release land let's do it and that i hope will be the positive legacy of the entire corona debacle crisis fiasco if we can just look beyond it there is a better way of running the place and it'll be informed by everything we do in the next few months. Yeah. So John, you know, I don't want to minimize anybody losing their jobs. But again, as I said, if the state does what we're talking about, job losses will be minimized. Yeah. We will go into hibernation rather than go into a dramatic stagnation. That's what we've got to look at. This is a hibernation. And then coming out of that, Maybe, just maybe, 
the extraordinary communal effort to try and minimise the mortality rate and keep the intensive care units open could be applied to other economic issues where thus far we failed to really achieve what we're trying to do, which is try and get the best outcome for everybody in the society. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, it's, it's interesting you should mention community and the community effort. What I find really encouraging and kind of uplifting is in the last week or two weeks or whatever it is, when the HSC, the government did a shout out for volunteers, I think it's something like 60,000 people have signed up to volunteer. You know, people who have healthcare experience and also people who don't, like you and I. Yeah, by the way, John and I have signed up. I, 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 this, is, this, is, uh, this is a health warning to the HSE. If you see our emails coming in, because I know you responded to them, if I were you, I would... Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to do what? Well, I, I actually... I, I, like, skills. What skills do I have? I said I'd do hospital radio. Hospital radio is great. Yeah. Hospital radio, that's Or good. drive an L van. I don't, drive I don't an L van. I'll drive an L van or I'll kind of... I don't know. I don't know. I'll talk economics to somebody. I mean, does that make people feel better? Maybe in actual no. fact, uh, talking economics to people is not necessarily the thing that would bring you through uh, this crisis. But uh, be like, act like an anaesthetic, wouldn't it? Yeah, I know exactly. A very severe anaesthetic. Listen, we're gone. Enjoy yourself. Stay out of trouble. Stay away from each other. And thank you for listening. We'll be back to you next week. Cheers. 